Let's take some time to look at a long history of the Jews in the Byzantine Empire, which is an area of research that has not seen the same amount of attention as, for example, the Jews of Western Europe. Um, and this is actually quite a significant, large uh, period of time that we're going to be talking about and a significant amount of territory as well. But let's uh, at least have a very brief overview. So first of all, where was the Byzantine Empire? Uh, you can see here on this map, it is the yellow region, and it is distinct from the kind of orangish, reddish region to the left, which is the Roman Empire. Now, both the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire were Christian. Uh, the Roman Empire, of course, becomes Catholic uh, with the, the rulership of a single pope in Rome. The Byzantine Empire is a little bit more complex. It ends up developing several patriarchs who uh, rule the uh, the spiritual aspect of the Christian nation, and it has an emperor uh, who is based in Constantinople. That's this really crucial city over here. You can see on a narrow strait, the Bosporus, that links the uh, Black Sea with the larger Mediterranean Sea. And it was known originally as Byzantium, and then from the 4th century on, it's known as Constantinople, which is Greek for Constantine city, named after the the Emperor Constantine. And then after the Turkish conquest in 1415-3, which will mark the end point of today's uh, quick video, uh, it becomes named uh, Istanbul, and it becomes, of course, a Muslim uh, city at that point. But uh, for the period that we're talking about, from the early 4th century right up until the middle of the 15th century, you have this significantly large Byzantine Empire with uh, a, a lot of control over North Africa, Israel as well, and uh, of course the, the concentration of it is in Asia Minor and the Balkans and Greece. Um, it's also important to note that the Roman Empire uh, will shortly fall into decline. They will be attacked by the Germanic tribes from the north, and Rome will be sacked a few times until finally it, it falls, and it, it ends up uh, going into the beginning of what we call the Dark Ages until the Renaissance, again, almost a thousand years later. So when Rome falls, the Byzantine Empire becomes its inheritor, particularly in terms of the transmission of Christianity. Uh, the city of Constantinople becomes, as it were, the second Rome. And the uh, when it falls in the 15th century, ultimately, the third Rome is often considered Moscow. Uh, of course, the first Rome will uh, come back, but that's not for our discussion today. Let's focus a little bit on the history of the Jews in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so, in the Byzantine Empire, the Roman status of Judaism as a religio licita, meaning a legal religion, begins to erode in the 4th century onward. Uh, conversion to Judaism, for example, is prohibited as the church begins to gain a lot more control over how the entire empire is run. And whereas conversion to Judaism is prohibited, conversion from Judaism is, of course, encouraged. And uh, various legislations are put in place, such as, for example, uh, Jewish parents who uh, have children who decide to become Christian uh, are forbidden from disinheriting them. And in fact, they, they have to continue to support them, uh, and uh, these Christian children of their Jewish parents will inherit them. This is an issue, by the way, that goes on for uh, many centuries, and not only in the Byzantine Empire, uh, it, it comes up even in the early modern period. At any rate, there's a, a remarkably uh, dramatic step towards greater hostility to Judaism from the 4th century onward. Uh, you see the rhetoric increases in heat, uh, especially with people like St. John Chrysostom, the so-called golden mouth, who issued a number of really flaming, nasty sermons against the Jews, and his approach to Judaism uh, made a significant impact really on the entire Eastern world, especially when you connect it to the Third Rome, Moscow, and the uh, Slavic iterations of Byzantine Christianity. Of course, the, the Orthodox churches, as they're called today, are influenced by the Byzantine Empire. Uh, 
You also have some, you know, deep reach into the Jewish practice by the emperors who are now officially Christians. Justinian I, for example, uh, attempted to forbid the study of the Mishnah, especially as a use uh, in its uh, interpretive function of the Torah, and tries to actually dictate which non-Hebrew translations of the Torah are accepted. In other words, which Greek versions in particular are acceptable for use among Jews of the Byzantine Empire. Um, there are numerous violent attacks on Jews and, and incidents of forced conversions, and you actually have Jews rebelling in the 4th and the 6th and 7th century in particular. Uh, when the Persians eventually invade Israel, as we discussed a few weeks ago, uh, the Jews will support them because they are uh, fed up with the uh, the degree to which the uh, Byzantine Empire tries to interfere in Jewish practice. They even banned at one point um, Purim parties because they tended to get out of hand and since they're associated with uh, drunkenness and kind of frivolity and sometimes a mockery of Haman which can sometimes be extended in the political and social context to mockery of other authority figures, they actually tried to ban uh, drunkenness on Purim. Good luck with that. Uh, under the iconoclasts, so this is a movement that uh, you see developing in the, the uh, 8th and 9th century. There's a couple of episodes where the uh, Byzantine Empire goes through this kind of paroxysm of purging of any kind of physical representation of uh, divine figures. That's the, the sense of iconoclasm, which means essentially to destroy icons, to destroy images. Uh, here's one Psalter from the 9th century that has a kind of a clever representation. This is, of course, from the pro-icon image, or else there wouldn't be any icons on it at all. And you can see here is a representation of the crucifixion scene, and uh, Jesus is given gall to drink. It's on a kind of a sponge on the end of a stick. And here is a representation of a 9th century iconoclast. Uh, his face is wiped out, but his hair looks, you know, really wild and barbarian. He's in red as well. And he is in, in, a, in a way kind of echoing that uh, passion scene by uh, using some kind of sponge to attempt to wipe out an icon uh, at the end of a stick. So this is kind of something that was going on. It was actually two distinct periods when this was very uh, frequent. How that connects to Jews is significant because the, uh, the, the iconoclasts often cast the heretics as Jews. So the, even though they're talking about other Christians, the, uh, the idea of heresy is, is associated with Jews in particular. Basil I attempted to impose a widespread forced conversion in the year 873. This decree was ultimately rescinded by a successor, Leo IV, but was attempted again in 943 by another emperor, Romanus I Lecapenus. Uh, it is at this time that we have reports of Jews fleeing from the Byzantine Empire to the north, to the Khazarian Empire, which is really fascinating, ends up becoming very involved with the correspondence of Chastai ibn Shaplut with uh, figures purporting to be uh, you know, Khazarian leaders. Uh, and during this time, Italy emerges as a major center of Jewish creativity. There's a lot of fascinating things coming out of South Italy at this time. Also interesting is what's going on in Bulgaria, where you have two figures, Saints Cyril and Methodius, who are very much involved in uh, transmitting the Byzantine Christian heritage to the Slavic peoples. And ultimately, they will have a, a massive impact on Ukrainians and Poles and Russians, although the Poles, of course, are Catholic. But the uh, fascinating, uh, they seem to have some awareness of things Jewish and some contact with Jews as well. Uh, just to give you one example, the alphabet that is associated with their activity, of course, the alphabet that is used with some minor variation among many of the Eastern Orthodox peoples like the Russians and the Ukrainians, uh, it clearly shows evidence of Hebrew. For example, the letter uh, which in Hebrew is shin and is pronounced in English with the sound sh, you know, pronounced together, sh. They took that sound and they took the Hebrew letter to create the Cyrillic letter for that sound, sh. And there are several other examples, like you see the word uh, 
Saturday in Hebrew is Shabbat, and in uh, Russian it's Subota. I mean, there's lots of borrowings from things Jewish, largely through the activity of St. Cyril and Methodius. When we get to the end of this period, I think one of the most dramatic things to, to point out is the uh, horrific Fourth Crusade, which just shows how bankrupt the entire crusading movement had become just a, a century after it had first been initiated. And uh, the Fourth Crusade was uh, actually the second crusade in which the crusaders actually attacked other Christians rather than going to Jerusalem and trying to achieve what was the purportedly, uh, you know, stated idea of the crusade, which was to, uh, you know, free it from Muslim rule. Uh, in the year 1204, they approached Constantinople. Again, remember, it's a Christian city, although under Orthodox rule rather than under Catholic rule. And uh, the, uh, the crusaders uh, ended up sacking the city of Constantinople rather than heading on down to Jerusalem. Uh, once they got into this massive and important capital city, they found so much wealth that the vast majority decided to stay and take their prizes and their spoils from, from other Christians rather than make their way down to Jerusalem, and very few of them, in fact, did so. And there was Latin rule in that region until 1261. Uh, the Jewish quarter, of course, was also sacked and burned. Apparently, the Jews were fairly wealthy in Constantinople at this time. They were especially associated with tanning and with the uh, textile trades, and textiles in particular, a very long Jewish tradition. Uh, even my own father, Allah Vashalem, may he rest in peace, was also involved in the textile trade. Um, the Jews of Constantinople managed to survive uh, and to recover after that uh, attack by the Fourth Crusaders, um, but uh, outside of Constantinople there were uh, notable moments of persecution, particularly in the Greece and the Balkans. And this all ends in 1453, at least this kind of you know, uh, conceptual unit of Jewish history, when the Turks would invade Constantinople and would bring in an entirely new period in Jewish history. It would be especially strengthened by the uh, arrival of many refugees in the Sephardic diaspora after the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492. Okay, I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much for watching.